Between 1940 and 1950, penicillin was introduced, and the atom was split. Orson Welles made his masterpiece, Citizen Kane. Rogers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma opened on Broadway. And Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected president a third time and a fourth. Overshadowing everything was a world war that would cost more than 55 million lives. If it wasn't the first day, I was up there soon afterwards. Because yeah. I can remember who played then, too, I think. I'm pretty sure easy. We need to hear it. And Pollock, catch, catcher, the first baseman was Heller, and the second baseman was Malivy, shortstop was O'Neill, third baseman, I think, was... I don't know, no, Coswell was the next year, I think. I think, or maybe, maybe he was the third baseman, because he went up with Buffalo the next year. And it was Johnny Newman, and it was a uh, center fielder, I can't hardly remember. I know Lurchin played the next year. He was real good. I always liked him. And it was Rap, you know, he looked like Andy Gump, you know, a good picture. The very thought of you. And I forget to do the little ordinary things that everyone ought to do. I'm living in a kind of daydream. I'm happy as a king. everything the mere idea of you the... Jamestown's representative in the Pony League started in 1939 playing in Celeron Park first game was held in May of 1939 and Jamestown won but the season was less than desirable on July 28th, business manager James Matthews made a proposal to the City of Jamestown Council requesting that the city build the Jamestown Baseball Club a new stadium. A suggestion was property on East 2nd Street below Hopkins Avenue and included part of the Curtis Farm. The winter prior to the 1940 season contained bad news for the Jamestown baseball fans. The Pittsburgh Pirates made the decision to leave Jamestown and to move their club to London, Ontario. Jamestown was left without a team, however, were hopeful. With the guidance of Judge Barger, seen on the right, reports were made that the stadium would be built to entice an expansion team or an existing team. On June 5, 1940, Reports from Niagara Falls mentioned that because of poor attendance, owner Harry Bisgeyer, here seen next to Judge Barger, second from the right, would move to Jamestown if proper facilities were made available. Bisgeyer was aware of the drive by Jamestown to raise funds for a new stadium. The fund drive was proving successful, and on July 3rd, Niagara Falls announced plans to move to Jamestown. On July 19th, over 3,000 fans came out to see their Falcons take on Hamilton at Allen Park. The home team's Henry Nowak launched a late-inning two-run homer 
to send the crowd home happy with a 7-5 win. This was the starting lineup. Here's a picture of the 1940 team with its bat boy, Charlie Panabianco. Solid run. First year. In 1939. Then in 40, they went to Allen Park. Uh -huh. And then in 41, they went to the stadium. Okay, and you were, you were the bat boy after Jimmy Barone. Yeah, 40. At, at Allen Park. Allen Park. And I got to know Sal Magley Tell really Tell me good. about Sal Magley. Sal Magley, uh, the barber. He played with the Dodgers and with the Giants, played with the Yankees shortly. He pitched against Don Larson in the World Series mm -hmm. when he picked the perfect game. Well, he came here years later at a banquet they had at Jamestown, and uh, he was all dressed up, real sharp. He was making about 40000 a year then, you know. It, it, if he was playing today, that'd be worth about four, four or five million. But... Uh, I'm, I went to at the boys' club because I knew he was going to be there, but I didn't figure he remembered me, you know, so I didn't go up to speak to him or anything. Well, he came to me after the banquet. He came over there and talked to me, shook my hand. He says, you used to be the lumber man there at the bad boy, you know. <laughs> I mean, I felt real good about it, you know, real good. What was he like? Buffalo sent him down here for seasoning, and then he went back to Buffalo, and then I guess he went to the big leagues after that, and then he jumped the big leagues for some reason. He went to play in the Mexican League for about five years, and this is where he really learned to pitch. Mm -hmm. He developed this curveball. They called him the barber because he'd throw it right, you know. But every time you looked at the guy, he looked like he needed a shave all the time. He hit, his beard was, you know. But it, he was classy. He was one of the best when he was pitching. He won 23 games or something for the Giants one year and over 20 games for the Dodgers. When he he was, was tough, a money pitcher. Was he? When he was here, Chuck Sal Magley, when, when he came down and pitched in Jamestown, did you say, gee, there, there's a good pitch, they pitcher? Did, they didn't think much of him then. Like I say, he learned to pitch in the Mexican League. Here's a picture of a 19-year-old Warren Spawn on the right, where he played his first professional season for Bradford of the Pony League in 1940. Here's Charlie's reminiscences. Yeah, when he played, uh, I think he played for Bradford right. at the time. Warren Spawn, Gene Hermansky went to the Dodgers, the same. Yeah, there's a, there was five or six of them that went to the big leagues that, at that time. That but played, that did played they really, did Warren Spahn really stand out then? Oh yeah. He could was, you tell that he was good? Yeah, was he was Something good. extraordinary? Yeah, he was tough. He, he, he won 300 <laughs> games for crying out loud. It's from Buffalo, the east side. Well, I mean, you, you, you've seen the players play like this year. Yeah, uh, no comparison. Because these guys, uh, they, they were more developed. They were a little bit older than the kids today. These guys had more experience in them days. And they went up to the big leagues. Warren Spahn, Gene Hermansky with the Dodgers, Frankie Carswell went up to Detroit, O'Neill from Jamestown, uh, shortstop, Philadelphia Phillies during the war years. One year he played, I think. One of the most well-known individuals was Greg Malevi. He was the manager during the championship years of 1941 and 1942. Attendance was at an all-time high of over 122,000 in 1941 and 143,000 in 1942, an all-time Jamestown high and a minor league record high for several years. Greg Malevi was born in Detroit in 1905 and played shortstop for the Chicago White Sox and the Boston Red Sox. He became well known for his eight memorable years at Buffalo 
which in later years led to his election in the Buffalo Baseball Hall of Fame. After retiring in 1940, he came to Jamestown as a player manager, where he hit 355 in 1941 and 320 in 1942. Those were the days of the great Jamestown Olean rivalry, where Greg Malevy and Jake Pittler, the Olean pilot, were part of the color and hot civic pride that permeated the league. Ironically, in 1958, Jake Pittler and Greg Malevy's paths would cross as teammates as they were coaches for the Los Angeles Dodgers. However, it was the early 1940s when Pittler and Malevy were managers against each other in what was then called the finest Class D league in baseball. In May of 1991, Greg returned home to celebrate the first Lucy Fest, where we had a chance to interview him. Probably remember the name. My father is probably somebody you know. We used to manage the Jamestown Falcons. Remember the Falcons? Remember this. Oh, dear God. Remember all of Oh, my God. There I am. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. I was a bad boy, kind of. I uh, used to a large bat boy. Be able to play with these guys who were like gods to me at the time, these minor league ball players. But to me, they were gods that walked, you know, trod the, the turf at Municipal Stadium, and they were these giants who were great ball players. And I got the opportunity as a little kid to play catch with them and take infield practice. I would take infield practice with these guys. And that was a great thrill. That was pretty good. Get to do the little ordinary things that everyone ought to do. I'm living in a kind of daydream. Well, my dad started in the sand lots of Detroit. For Koenig Cole was the first picture I ever saw of my dad playing ball. He had a mitt, I think it was about as big as my hand. In those days, they, the mitts were so small, as you know. <laughs> and oddly enough, we looked an awful lot alike in, in many respects. And uh, I can recall him playing Sandlot, and that's all I wanted to do when I was a kid, play ball, and that's all he ever wanted to do. And all he really ever did much. He didn't go, he went to school as little possible. And, uh, play ball all the time. He would skip sometimes and play ball. I don't recommend that to anybody, but, <laughs> but uh, that's what he would do. And I, uh, then he played for another another a company team, the name I can't remember. Connie Cole was the first one. Then he played like Legion ball as a, as a little older man, but he played before it was his time. He's a very good player. He started playing American Legion before he was a teenager, which is pretty unusual. And uh, he wasn't big for his age, he was just good. And it caught the attention of some people and, and uh, he began to play more regularly and then he played regular Legion, not junior Legion, he began to play regular Legion ball when he was in his early teens. And he almost signed a contract when he was 15, but his mother wouldn't let him do it. So he went to work. You see, my dad got out of high school and he went to work he got out fairly early, and he went to work for Fisher Body because his uncle was the head of Fisher Body. His name. What ultimately brought him to Jamestown? Did he bring the family with the Jamestown yes. at the time? Yes. This was the first place we had lived in Buffalo, but he fell in love with the area, and he knew a guy named Fred Smith, who was one of his best friends, who's still alive today, living in Jamestown, who's a native, and. How we ever got the job here, I guess he got to know Harry Bisgar, I guess, who convinced him to come down here and play and manage. 
<clears throat> and they, they fell in love with the area. What's not to fall in love with this area? I mean, it's gorgeous, as you know, and that's why you're here, and that's why Russ is here. The whistle. Yeah. And it went something like this. <laughs> Only he did it three times louder than that. Yeah. And would beat it. <laughs> he did this little short thing and then this long one. And it was a whistle that he used to gain attention, and he clapped when he was coaching, like third yeah. base mm -hmm. or something. And even for the dugout. And uh, it was a very, it was an incredibly large whistle. You I mean, call you loud home? Whistle. Call you home at night? Oh yeah, and that was the whistle. We heard that when we had to scoot home fast. <laughs> my mother called, we could linger. But when my dad called, we lickety split home because he was a, a strict disciplinarian in many, many respects. And then also the nicest guy in the world. Yeah. Was... Do you remember Jake Pittman? Um, yes, yeah. I was never very close to him, but certainly by name. Well, I can remember my dad talking. They used to stage. And then they'd get serious, uh, plan to, to get increased fan support. They would have arguments with the umpires. And then they argue amongst themselves. You know, Jake and my father used to go at it. And they would plan what they do and what they they do this. And then the papers would be full of this stuff. And boy, the fans would come out in droves the next yep. night. So like a wrestling match. They were the well, it was an element of, of, of theatricality, yeah. a little showbiz in, in both their veins. <laughs> well, I think some of that rubbed off on me. Wanted. Remember them arguing. You know, yeah, and the veins would pop out. I thought, dear God, I used to get so involved. <laughs> and even in, in the early 40s, I'd get so involved, too, because I was just a little itty bitty guy, you know. But my dad would argue. I thought it was for real, you know, and I would get all upset. And he'd say, <laughs> he'd come back and he'd say, I'm just kidding, don't worry, kid. don't worry, don't worry, son. And don't worry, it's not, it's not that serious, he would say. He never admitted that, he, that it was an act until much later, and I thought, <laughs> 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 hey, Greg is next. of the great jamestown Olean rivalry, where Greg Malevy and Jake Pittler, the Olean pilot, were part of the color and hot civic pride that permeated the league. It was the early 1940s when Pittler and Malevy were managers against each other in what was then called the finest Class D league in baseball. Do you remember Jake Pittler? Um, yes, yeah. I was never very close to him, but certainly by name. Well, I can remember my dad talking. They used to stage, and then when they'd get serious, uh, plan to, to get increased fan support. They would have arguments with the umpires, and then they'd argue amongst themselves. You know, Jake and my father used to go at it, and they would plan what they do and what they do, they do this, and then the papers would be full of this stuff, and boy, the fans would come out in droves the next yep. night. So, like a wrestling match, they were the. Well, it was an element of, of, of theatricality, I, yeah. a little showbiz in, in both their veins. <laughs> well, I, I think some of that rubbed off on me. Wanted. I remember them arguing, you know, and, and the veins would pop out. I thought, dear God, I used to get so involved. <laughs> and even in, in the early 40s, I'd get so involved, too, because I was just a little itty bitty guy, you know. But my dad would argue. I thought it was for real, you know, and I would get all upset. <laughs> and he'd say, he'd come back and he'd say, I'm just kidding, don't worry, kid. don't worry, don't worry, son. And don't worry, it's not, it's not that serious, he would say. He never admitted that, he, that it was an act until much later. And I, <laughs> <laughs> he was coaching third base. I had a close play where his better runner 
hit the ball to the shortstop, and the ball just beat him there. And then his foot, I called him out. Jake Pittler was coaching third base. He ran across the mound over to first base where I was umpiring. He took his hat off, and he's motivating the fans now. He says to me, now on, everybody tells me you're a good umpire. I, he's going through these gestures, see? I think you're a good umpire. Everybody tells me you got good eyesight. I think you've got good eyesight. He wasn't yelling like I am, see? So when the inning ended, well, well, let's say, well, then he put his cap on and went back to third base. So when the inning ended, the plate umpire, Frank Ballack, he was from the Canadian side, he called me halfway. He says to me, now, well, what did he tell you? Oh, I says, he told me I was a good umpire. He told me I had good eyesight. He said, what? He said, it looked like he was killing you. Well, that's the story of Jake Pittler. The most hated by the fans, and that was Jake Pittler. You know, I was like to see Jake Pittler come to town, because he was good for a couple of bucks. He, 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 he give me a couple of bucks when I bring him his towel. Up, and he was very nice. Jack Sand was a nice guy, but Jake was just about the best tonight. I, I really liked him. He came here for a show. Yeah, I'm telling you, uh, I'll never forget the time. He always carried a dozen baseballs on my side of the dugout, on my side of the dugout. And I had a home run one day, the whole baseball. They said, oh my God, you threw the baseball. They said, impossible. <laughs> uh, but he was a fine gentleman. Now, the pillar put on a show for you folks here in Jamestown? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was into it every day. Everybody wanted to sit on every, the Every day. He starts something every day. That's what he's doing here for them. Jake Pittler, we just gave all, he all was a show in himself. shades of hell, yeah, when, and uh, I can remember he reacted a lot with the grandstand and with the bleachers. Oh, he yeah. baited the crowd. Yeah, yeah, did he? Oh, geez, I can remember, and I remember, and we would boo, and we would cat call him, you know, and he'd turn around, he'd give as good as he got, you know. So Pittler, was he a showman? Oh, God, yes. Would he get the crowd excited? Yeah. How yeah. would he do it? kick the dirt and he'd argue with the umpires and he'd all emotions and argue with the fans and but he was popular the people liked it you know and it was a rivalry see mm -hmm. it uh, you don't see that today anymore mm -hmm. you say one word and the ump will throw you right out of the game they never threw them out you know it's a, <laughs> they liked them i mean that's what baseball was mm -hmm. see but it was really something 55 world champion Brooklyn Dodgers. Johnny Padres pitching brilliant ball. One out to go. Elston Howard, ground short. Reese throws to Hodges. Brooklyn wins. And the Dodgers go wild as they mob pitcher Padres who hurls Brooklyn to its first world championship. Not another word. And all people said to me, how could you have been so calm at such a tremendous moment? Well, I wasn't. I could not have said another word without breaking down in tears. Jake was a medical part of the team, not only because he's a first reason, but he would talk to players. Players like him, because he's one of the few coaches that didn't have that aloof attitude about him. You could tease him, you could say things, and Jake would just laugh. I remember we play in Chicago, they'd fly down Lakeshore Drive, and they'd yell out, Jake! And he'd look at her. There's a Jewish Navy out there, and they, and he, glad. he said, well, no, they don't have enough sails on those boats to be our Navy. You know, he wouldn't get angry. You know, he would go along with the joke, and then you, you'd be there. And, and he, it's like my first guy with the Dodgers. I, I tell people I was the best batting practice pitcher going. They said, well, I said, well, they weren't pitching me. So I said, and I said, I got fired from that job. Jake Pridley, after two weeks, said, Joe Black, don't you ever come here and pitch batting practice anymore. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you throw too many balls in the stands. I said, Jake, they're supposed to hit the ball. He said, not that many. I said, what am I batting practice? Because <laughs> you can feel it. He feels the pain just like everybody else. And, but he was one of the guys who would come over and encourage you. Because when you lose in a big league, you can get down. But Jake would tell you, hey, it's always tomorrow. And you feel good. So 
you guys who had an opportunity to be around Jake a long time, you're around a great guy, a great American, not just somebody in baseball. Jake was one of those uh, valuable people with young players. Jake was great with young players. He and Sukaforth were buddies, and they lived together at the Bossard Hotel and uh, buddied at night after the game. But Jake took most of us under his wing and uh, in a nice, easy sort of way. I never heard Jake get too excited. Uh, he, he really helped us in the early years. One of the classic stories is uh, told by Vince Scully about, uh, about Jake Pittler. Jake was a first base coach. He also was uh, in batting practice. He handled the balls and all that, but he, he coached first base. So he's down there and Jake was very enthusiastic. Now he's an old gentleman by this time, or it seemed old to me. He's probably younger than I am now. But anyway, he was he was down at first base, and we're behind, and it's late in the game, and we're trying to get something going, and so so we get a guy on. So Jake is exercising. Well, in those days, you only had a couple of cameras, uh, TV cameras, so you didn't have all the coverage. So Scully is describing. He tells this story, uh, the excitement that Jake is showing as as a little momentum starts to build. And so now, oh, we get two men on. Oh, you know, and said, he said, Jake is going bananas down there. He's jumping up and down. And here's this old gentleman, and he is spry as a young kid. Look. So now the count on the next hitter goes three and two. And Scully, off camera or somehow through the network, they could speak to the director. He wants him to put a camera on Jake, and he gets this build up. And he says, now, the count's three and two, and on the next pitch, Jake is, he is doing leapfrogs down there on every pitch because we'll get this thing going. Now we're going to let you see Jake on the 3-2 pitch and you can tell whether it's a ball or a strike. So Vince said, now we got it all set. They zoom in on Jake, here comes the pitch, and I guess it was a foul ball or something. And he said all Jake did was reach down and scratch his crotch. <laughs> <laughs> and Scully says, I, I couldn't say don't look, <laughs> or wait a minute, that's not what I meant. <laughs> he, said, he said, what would I say? Yeah, I was lying. Oh, so Jake, he said, Jake, Jake really did the one thing you never dreamed might happen, but he said, that's what did happen. But Jake was um, there for years and years, um, retired. I think when he retired, Greg Malevi uh, was his replacement. A fine class guy. He, uh, I didn't have as many years with him as I did Jake, but uh, uh, Jake had a good sense of humor too. We we kidded him a lot, and but he was always uh, he'd come in after a ball game in Ebbets Field. We had a big iron door, and when that door would shut, it would just reverberate and boom. And uh, especially if a guy was mad and slammed it, but but we'd come in after a game and we'd be celebrating, you know, and Jake would yell out. Forget that one. We got to win tomorrow. You know he didn't. <laughs> he, didn't he didn't want. He didn't want you to linger too long on the, the fun of winning. In 1940, Johnny had a batting average of 314. In 1941, he led the league and won the Triple Crown, the batting average of 358, home runs of 29, and 96 RBIs. In 1942, he repeated as the batting champion at a 353 batting average and broke his own league home run record of 30 that year. He had 115 RBIs, truly the Sultan of Swat. Who was this person who was variously called by the sports writers the Sovereign of Swat, the Mastodon of Mace, the Blonde Bomber, the Baron of Big Bingles, and the Swat Smith? Where did he come from? And what was his impact on the Jamestown community? John Newman, perhaps the most popular baseball player ever to wear a uniform for the Jamestown Falcons, arrived in Jamestown in 1940. However, prior to that time, 
John had great success at other minor league stops such as Owensburg, Kentucky of the Kitty League where he set a league home run record of 33 in 1939. John was born on December 20, 1913. He was an outstanding athlete at Roosevelt High School in Chicago where he captained the baseball and football teams. He pitched and played the outfield and in addition he was an all-city guard in football. Many folks have indicated that John had natural ability to slug a ball that could have led him to the majors. But in Minneapolis in 1937, with the baseball world at his slender feet, Newman charged towards a bag, leaned his upper body back to the infield turf, and shot his legs forward in a fateful slide. His spikes caught on the rough turf, and enough pressure was exerted on his body to snap his left legs. Six months later, Newman had grown from 185 to 240 pounds in the hospital. A battle with obesity began that would cost him a chance at the major leagues. When the 1939 season ended, Newman was signed by Harry Bisgar to play for the Niagara Falls Rainbows and soon found himself as a Jamestown Falcon. I remember we started off the year, we were both hitting the, about the same number of home runs for a, a couple of weeks, and then he, I said, I'll bet you I'll hit you in home runs, John. He said, that's a bet. I don't know what we bet a buck or two. But by the year was over, I had, I don't know, about 16, and he had 40-something. <laughs> <laughs> but he could hit them hard. Well, he hit a couple Just of no with one the long line. fence they had. He way over the outfielder's heads. But it's took him all day to run around the bases. He liked the <laughs> beer and limber oh, and cheese. Oh, yeah, yeah, he liked it. <laughs> there was a, a road that went around the ballpark like this, and there was a house across the street, that road. See, the road went around the stadium. There was a house there. Newman hit the ball over that house. <laughs> honest to God, that's the honest to God's truth. I'm not kidding you. He would hit that ball 500 feet, like Babe Ruth. <laughs> Roly-poly John Newman touched off a rally that put the issue beyond beck or call. He caught one of pitcher Lefty Henry's choicest hooks. The ball traveled on a line and was only 10 feet above the shortstop's head, but in further transit gained altitude. It wasn't a towering bash, but a line drive of tremendous velocity. Passing the left field fence, 360 feet from the plate, the ball continued in the air, then stretched along like a well-hit low drive on a baked fairway. The first mention of Johnny Newman in Jamestown. Down all of a sudden with a big stadium like that, and see a guy like him get up and knock that ball over that field, those people went crazy. They went crazy. Jamestown's Johnny Newman got the first circuit clout of the 1941 Pony Baseball League season at the Municipal Stadium, driving the ball more than 400 feet over the center field fence. But he was the best rider he'd ever played with. He could have played major league ball. Oh, what a nice fellow he was on the ball club. He was a, he was a stabilizer. No matter what went on in the club, John was on the right side. Johnny Newman? He used to hit baseball that the shortstop used to jump for and just miss on the end of the glove and up and out. They used to go. But I'll never forget old John. He, uh, he's always talking about being a left fielder. See, he's a left fielder. He, he had to be a left fielder. He, uh, he caught and they put him on the mound a few times to throw knuckle balls, you know. And John, he was a good ball player. He was a hustler, and, but he was uh, one of these kind of guys that would pull a string on you and he would. He would uh, play with you a little bit, and, uh, but when he got down to business, he was there, you know. He hit a lot of home runs, but he let a ball, a lot of bases. That's right. Yeah. A lot of runs landed because he couldn't beat the ball. That's right. But I mean, as a hitter, he was a great one. Oh, sure, sure. Strike! Johnny Newman was chewing the back of it. Spit hard. <laughs> now, Lord, he said that pitch was high. Well, I said, Johnny, let him throw it again. So, anyhow, he was angry. So, all right, so then the next pitch, see, Johnny Newman was angry that I called him a lousy call on the high pitch. So the next pitch, Johnny hit that ball, it's gone, it's gone. 
It hit that schoolhouse. Fifteen feet out of the park. Well, if he didn't hit a home run, he didn't get very far because he couldn't run that fast. <laughs> I always rode in the station wagon that he drove, mm -hmm. and as I said before, he, they always played cards, especially if they were going up to Hamilton on a, on a long trip or something like that. They'd get a card game going. Insisted that I sit next to him in the middle of the front seat and I played his cards for him. <laughs> I guess that's probably how I learned to play cards. <laughs> I have to thank him for but he And he also filled the stadium up with people. Yeah. Because you never knew uh, when he, you know, when he was going to hit that. You expected every time he come up to hit that ball over the, over the fence. Johnny Newman was at the zenith of his popularity. In fact, the popularity of Newman enabled the Falcons to set an attendance record of 122,000 in 1941 and even a better regular season mark of 144,000 in 1942, a minor league record that stood for years. player Johnny Newman who led the league for the second year in a row in batting was drafted by the Chicago draft board Johnny Newman said baseball has been good to me I have had the breaks in baseball I have received much more than a living from the game I'm ready and anxious to serve my Uncle Sam wherever I am needed Newman yeah Johnny Newman I saw that clown over that <laughs> talking he was on the same team as uh, Joe Garigiola. They played on the Vanilla Dodgers and I was in the Army. And I enjoyed their games. They were at Rizal Coliseum. I was pleased to be able to go see Johnny Newman. who played in the New York Penn League and I was associated with him. She had played there with Joe, Joe Garigiola. The fans loved him. Of course, every time he, wanted to, he came up, he wanted to see a home run, and a lot of times you did. But he was the Babe Ruth of the, of the Pony League at that time. Oh dear God! Remember all those? Oh my God! There I am! Oh <laughs> Jesus! I was a bat boy, kind of. My my one of my great heroes because he would play catch with me and he was always nice to me and he carried me around on his shoulders a couple of times. And he was a great roly poly burly guy. He wasn't that big and of course, then of course I knew him over the years. He was always my hero. <laughs> I remember getting on the bus as a kid to go downtown from Chestnut Street down downtown and then even in high school. He was a bus driver. He was still Johnny Newman to me, but he could hardly, you know, that, that <laughs> wheel, in those days, the wheel would make a groove in his stomach. <laughs> <laughs> it would be the belt, boop, and then the groove with his, with his steering wheel hit his stomach. Ordinary things that every I'm living in a kind of... Thanks for the memories, John. In 1939, when you came here and played against the Jamestown team. Roller coaster out in right field that I remember. And batting, the sun used to set across the lake and shine right in your eyes. And it was tough hitting, especially uh, Jamestown had a couple of pitchers. Uh, one guy by the name of Joe Black. His father was uh, some kind of an executive with Pittsburgh. And he could really throw hard. And boy, when you batted at night there, that was tough going. The following year, we come to Allen Park. I remember that had a big canvas all around the park. Billy knows just where to walk. And when I talk, I always talk with Billy. Because Billy knows just how to talk. One of Frank Heller's teammates in 1940 was Sal Magley. In Jamestown, he pitched seven consecutive complete games. Here's Frank's recollections of Sal. That's when he played with Niagara Falls. But uh, he was a good pitcher. He had a 
very good control, and he was not a regular pitcher you see now wind up and throw. He used to throw like darts at see, but he was pretty good. He used to knock them down underneath their chins. He was a funny guy, Sal Magdy. He used to have a forehead that came to like a point. He used to butt heads with people. Bet him that he'd knock them out. He did. He used to challenge guys to butt heads. Oh yeah, he pitched for Bradford. Did he? Yeah. Did you get any sense that the greatness there would spawn? Well, he always had good control. Even when he pitched in Buffalo at South Park High. But I never thought he'd win 363 games, but he did. This is an exceedingly rare photo taken in 1940 at Allen Park, and at the bat was Johnny Newman hitting one of his many home runs that year. He could hit, let me tell you. Johnny knows that. I remember we started off the year, we were both hitting about the same number of home runs for a couple of weeks, and then he, I said, I'll bet you I'll hit you in home runs, John. He said, that's a bet. I don't know why we bet a buck or two. But by the year was over, I had, I don't know, about 16 and he had 40 something. <laughs> <laughs> but he could hit him hard, John. Boy, he could hit him. Tell me about Olean's manager, Jake Pittler. He was a feisty old guy, though, Pittler. He was a, he was a institution with the Dodger outfit. Yeah. He was a, I guess he was with him about 45 years, almost as long as Lasorda. Yeah. But he would, he would egg the crowd on, as I understand. Oh, yeah, he was a... He was, he was a real showman, I'll tell you. He didn't just stand in a box like they do nowadays and do nothing. Oh. He'd <laughs> jump all over the place. The third baseman of the 1941 Jamestown Falcons was Frank Carswell. Well, I remember Frank Carswell. He was homesick for his mom. Uh, my mom down in Texas. Yeah. So he wanted to go home. And he was having a hell of a year. He was hitting the hell out of the balls up. Harry Bisgar sent for his mother and paid her to stay in Jamestown, That's so right. he wouldn't go home. That's the truth, too. He said, if my mommy can't come, I'm going That's to go right. home. That's right, he was going to go home. <laughs> he wanted to be a big shot. <laughs> and I hit a triple. It wasn't a triple, I got tagged out of third. But as I slid into third, the third baseman hit me on the chest. And I just rolled over and vomited all over third base. <laughs> Sick of the dog. That was my last chew in the back. I went, I went into gum from that on. Hey, listen, I have to work like that for my money. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, Jeez, wash those damn socks, shine the shoes. Got then they cheat you out of your jaw. Anyway. Oh, I have to go to Malivi. <laughs> hey, this guy owes me. This guy owes me. <laughs> Let me tell you, there wasn't too much chip in them days, and there wasn't that much money around. But I'll never forget the concession stand. This is uh, Kerner and her yeah. daughter yeah. Sylvia Silver, ran it. Yeah. And we'd come out after the game, and the popcorn would be left over. A couple of hot dogs laying on a grill that wasn't sold. Can I have one for a nickel? No way. Ten cents. <laughs> so I said to Ben, I said, Jesus, your mother's the toughest dame in the world. She won't even give me a whole hot dog for a half price. He says, Frank, business is business. <laughs> <laughs> when you go out with me, you never pay. But when you buy something, you pay. And that's how he was. They were tough with a buck. Of course, he wound up a millionaire, so he could, must have been a smart practice. Frank, what about the story between you and Frank Smirker? over a certain bet. Frank Schmerker and me said, Frank, when you hit, uh, I don't know how many home runs, and Schmerker pitches a shutout, which he hadn't done all year, he said, I'll buy you a good dinner. I said, okay, that's a good deal. But geez, on the last day of the season, I had the home runs early, but Frank Schmerker pitched a shutout the last game. And he invited us over to 210 Pine, and we walked in, and he took us in the cold room where all the Sides of beef were hanging all with what they called the uh, refrigeration. Yeah, but they had that cloth on it. Oh yeah, right. And they were all full of green hair. I said, "You're gonna feed us that?" <laughs> well, he said, "Them are real good steaks. When I get them cleaned up, they'll be delicious." Mm -hmm. So they trimmed them all down and cut all the mold off and everything. And we really had two steaks. Boy, they were about that round, about that thick. And then uh, right after that, uh, you get burned up the next year or two. Frank led the 1941 New Pony League 
as a top fielder with a 982 percentage and also led the Jamestown team by collecting the most hits, 145. After the 1941 season, he went back to his hometown of Buffalo and played for the Bisons. With Buffalo, 43, they sprained my ankle, I was out about two months. And in 44, I started with Buffalo, played about half, a, not even a half a season. I went in the Navy, two years I was in there, and then I come out and I got sent to Atlanta, Georgia in the Southern League. We won the pennant, played the Dixie World Series, and got beat by Dallas, who had half of old Buffalo's team with him that year. Okay. Hank Oana and a uh, pitcher by the name of Hank Perry, and, about five or six guys that played with Buffalo. And then uh, after that, I went to uh, Williamsport. I played at Williamsport the whole year, 47 and part of 48. And in 49, I went up to the Border League and I managed the team up there for a year and a half. I retired in 50. Watertown. <laughs> when you were in 43, Frank was playing with Buffalo and Parky was playing with Buffalo. And I was a kid, I was just, uh, you know, we all went up to, to Buffalo to take our physicals, pre-induction physicals, then you pass your physical, say I do, and two weeks later you get on the goddamn train and you're gone. And there was Frank, ranting and raving like he usually does. Gagger, come here. He said, this <laughs> son of a bitch, and he's pointing to Parky. He says, he saw a high school kid drop kick a football 96 yards in Jamestown. Now tell me it ain't so. God <laughs> 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 oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, one time in spring training, and somebody asked Lyle, he said, uh, is it a big jump from the D League to the AAA? He said, no, it's only 70 miles from Buffalo. <laughs> 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 but I, I just told my son this was the friendliest town I ever was in. We had a good time. There. Oh yeah, it was really nice. The very thought of you and I forget to do the little ordinary things that everyone ought to do. I'm living in a kind of daydream. I'm happy as a king. Introduction to Jamestown was really 1941, right? Coming here in, in, on, the, on the station wagon, just, we went to the, y, the YMCA mm -hmm. and stayed there a couple of nights and found a place to stay. Yeah. Did you, uh, now the team itself was managed by who? Greg Malevi. Greg Malevi? What do you think of what do you think of Greg? Great. Yeah. Great. What made him so unique, John? His just just his, his system of operation. Yeah. Get good players and let them play. You had a great year that year. Had a good year. Uh, and the fans voted you the most popular player. Yeah. Is that because you were the most handsome? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and your crowd you had was spectacular. Oh yeah. Every night down there, you'd go down there and you'd go down there at five thirty to 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 take pre game practice and and uh you have to wait, walk wait through the lines to get where get there it's the ball ball ballpark. Yeah. There are some movies in color of that first year, of which you're part of it, with, uh, again, Johnny Newman and, as you said, Frankie Carswell, and Johnny Pollock was your catcher. Yeah, good catcher. 
good good player, good guy on the club, well liked, never can cause no trouble. Johnny, you let off most of the season and you played shortstop. Uh, We had some big stuff, strong guys, John John Newman and Earl Rapp and Frankie Heller, mm -hmm. Frank Carswell. We had a great, 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 great ball club. Right. Hell, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't remember when we got beat. <laughs> we didn't get beat much. No. And you. <laughs> go, just go to the ballpark and stay out of their way. Don't, don't, don't get run over by the pros. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe that. Uh, oh man, well, you, you, you'd have to play on that ball club. You, you couldn't believe it. Yeah. We didn't have the best pitching in the world, but if we had a little bit of pitching, we, we never would have got beat. Right, right. Well, you're big. Big, big fun guy, uh, of course, who had a real reputation was Johnny Newman. Uh, what kind of guy was Johnny? You know, he, he was... <laughs> Tremendous. Yeah. Anyway, he never, he never had a bad, bad disposition. Yeah. Never was, never was mad. Because he's having one of them kind of years every time he walk up there. <laughs> he knocked one up on the hill. <laughs> <laughs> or strike out, and and I know that John uh, did he did he played left field. Yeah. He, was it, what kind of fielder was he? Good hands. Good hands. He didn't cover much ground, but he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but he had a good hand, good yeah. pair of hands. Yeah. He'd catch he'd catch anything he could get his mitts on. Right. Then you had a guy named Earl Rapp. Oh, well. <laughs> oh God, he was a great player. Right. Run like a deer and threw like hell. Didn't know where it was going. <laughs> and hit and run and uh, he could play her. Just, I, play, I, I played several years against him in the coast league. And uh, he was with Oakland and some of his clubs. And he's a good player, he's still a good player, a real good player. He ultimately, like you, he went. He got to the major leagues, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Um, he made several trips up there. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they didn't. I didn't like him. I, I I thought he was a great player. He could run, and he could throw, and he could, could catch the ball and hit 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 with power. What the hell do you want? Mm -hmm. What about Frankie Carswell? What do, you, what do you recall of Frank Carswell? Just as good, good a third baseman as you do, you want to have on the club. Mm -hmm. Big bat, big strong kid. Got along good with people, educated. Was he the one that his mother would come up and? and uh... Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, she, he was. He's. He was the baby. baby. Yeah. She had to come see her baby. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys rib him a little bit? Oh, all the time. Every day. Every day we'd give it to him. <laughs> Pat Pollock, he, that son of a bitch, he'd, 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 he never forgot anything like that. He kept, he kept he bringing it up all the time. Now, Johnny had played, he was a little bit older than you guys were. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. And your pitcher staff, that uh, who were some of the guys that were your, your pitchers? The best player on the ball club, all around baseball player, is Pete Angel. Pete Angel, right. And uh, then we had Belash and, and uh, Schmidt, Schaefer. Okay. Just, was Frank Smirk around the team? Smirk, Smirk, Smirk was a good was a good pitcher. He 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 won he won the big games for us all the time. And you had Stan Rogala. Oh, he relief relief, great great to just go out and strike strike guys out. The little, little guy my size, just come here, <laughs> <laughs> throw throw bullets. <laughs> You guys didn't carry a big squad, did you? How many people well, were in it? Well, 
He's about 14, 15. Yeah, it's amazing. And how would you travel from... Two station wagons. Two station wagons? Heller drove our wagon and Malivy drove the other one. Well, one time Schaefer sat in somebody's seat in, in Carswell, I believe. And Carswell, you, you, you're getting fooled with Carswell. And he jumped around, on, just about jumped on Schaefer about it. And Schaefer's a good old boy. He's a he's a he'll, hillbilly like me. <laughs> so, and and uh, he, he he didn't want no trouble. Hell, he was going good. He's he'd go out and pitch five hits, pitch pitches four or five innings, and Rogel would come in and relieve him. The game was over. Oh, Jamestown's been nice to me. Yeah. Give me a good woman for what a wife. Yeah. Fine daughter. I enjoyed it. My hometown is a year-round land of vacation And nearby, on the lakes, the Chautauqua Institution J-A-M-E-S-T-O-W-N Jamestown, New York, that's my hometown Jamestown, New York, that's my hometown Get to do the little ordinary things that everyone ought to do. I'm living in a kind of daydream. Our ceremonial first pitch tonight will be thrown out by none other than Mr. John Pollock who was a catcher at this game some 50 years ago. John Joseph Pollock the first string catcher of the 1941 Jamestown Baseball Club was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, April 2nd, 1918. Johnny was always a receiver since his school days at Tech High in Scranton, Pennsylvania, from which he was graduated with the class of 1937. Johnny later played with the St. Michael's Church team in his hometown and in 1938 went to Smithport, Pennsylvania to accept a job in the filtering department of the Quaker State Oil Company. He also played baseball at Smithport with the refinery team. And the first Jamestown Falcons game in the Pony League in 1939 was caught by John Pollock. Jamestown won that game 9-4, to four, beating Batavia. This was the beginning of 60 plus years and the Pony, now the New York Penn League. A scout working for Buffalo Bisons at that time was always went to these industrial league. And when they were starting a team here in Jamestown, they were looking for a catcher, so they came down and wanted to know if I wanted to play. And it was just like asking if I wanted to go 
the truth of my loan. I said, yes. So that's how I got to come up here. How much they paid, John? I'll tell you what they're paying me. They paid me is more the money that the uh, major league ball players are getting for lunch money than I made in salary. They were getting seventy-five dollars a day for meal money. I made sixty dollars a month. <laughs> and the next position was John Pollock catcher. Did you play with him all year long? Uh, no, I didn't play with him. All year. The starting catcher for the nineteen forty-one season. And that would be the first season at the stadium. Johnny at the time weighed 170 pounds, batted and threw right-handed, and was 5 foot 11 inches tall. The box score for the first game at the stadium, again against Batavia, unfortunately the score was 9 to 2 in favor of the opposing team. Day 1941 at this ballpark where you're in right now. They had a big crowd that day, didn't they? Over 5,000. Do you remember much about that opening day, the festivities yes, I, and stuff? I, I had a big day. Did you really? I had, I Three had, for four. Uh huh. And you're I, right. I had a single, double, and a triple. And I know I was here. I had, uh, I won all the prizes. <laughs> a lot of fond memories in this ballpark. Yes, yes. In fact, they used to call it the nickel and dime ballpark. The kids used to check, uh, go to school and bring a nickel and dime and put it in the kitty for the ballpark. That's how they, when they built the stadium. And the man behind that thing was Judge Barker. Yeah, we got a big baseball player. Players manager, did he? He was a players manager, and Greg believed in one thing. You do as I say, you'll never get in trouble. I can remember the time we we lost about five games in a row. Ooh. And Greg was getting all kinds of telephone calls from people. They seen somebody here at one o'clock in the morning and somebody say. So Greg called us all in center field before the ball game. I guess in the middle he said, uh, I don't know what's going on, fellas, but it's got to stop. He said, I get a call at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. They see you out here. They see this guy out there. And we're not winning. So it's got to stop. From that time on, we won about 18 ball games in a row. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you have rarely lost, I know that. And he was a, he was a, a real fine guy. Now he was a player manager, wasn't he? That's right, played second base. Second base? Mm -hmm. Remember that whistle of his? Yep. Still whistle when he was coaching Detroit. Uh, Is that right? The Dodgers. Yeah. Uh, so you know, can you do the whistle? No, I... <laughs> yeah, that's right. How'd it go again? You could hear it all. What's your thoughts about Jake Pittler? Uh, he was an actor, really, but... Uh, he came here for a show. Yeah, I'm telling you. Uh, I'll never forget the time... He always carried a dozen baseballs alongside him in the dugout, alongside the dugout. And I hit a home run here one day, and he got a hold of that baseball. He said, oh, my God, he didn't. He threw the baseballs in the air. He said, impossible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, but he was a fine gentleman. What about your first baseman, Frankie Heller? Frankie was a oh, good ball player. One thing about Frankie... He had a, a mean disposition for me. Oh, did he? Oh, Frank. I'll never forget the time he was on first base. And he always had a big chew of tobacco in him all the time. And Frankie wasn't paying attention at all where the ball hit him in the stomach and he swallowed it. Oh, I, I, we thought he was going to die. My choice, I would say Earl Rat. I loved him. I thought he was great. Yeah. Why? Why? Because he had a potential zone. He was a great runner, a good hitter, and he could play the field. Mm -hmm. I bet you're thinking, well, maybe Johnny moved. No, I can't. Johnny couldn't. He hit a lot of home runs, but he let a ball, a lot of bases. That's right. Yeah. A lot of runs landed because he couldn't feel the ball. That's right. But I mean, as a hitter, he was a great one. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But Earl Rapp is uh, be my times. He was a gentleman. We used to hang out with the humidor. Yeah, I know that. Yep, those kids used to go get autographs. Yeah. 
And Harry would come up and he'd see him with an old shirt on. He'd say, well, how come you got that? And he said, I haven't gotten anything else, Harry. Come with me. He took me down to Big Blue and bought everybody a shirt. And after every ball game when we played, if uh, the treasurer of the ball club was a fellow working at the Bank of Jamestown, yeah, I think he's dead now. Harry would send him in and he said, Tell any kid down there who wants, needs any money, just ask him, he'll give it to you. But he was a fine, fine gentleman, believe me. We, we were staying for <coughs> with a family by the name of Milks. <coughs> and they moved, we moved. <laughs> really? How many ball players were in that home? Just Johnny and O'Neill and I. Okay, well, you, you were roommates. Yeah, Johnny and I were roommates were in Buffalo, too. Was that right? Then John went up to the major leagues. Then with the majors, he went over to the Pacific Coast League. He played the Coast League for about 10, 12 years. Really? In the 1990 Jamestown Jammers program, John Pollock was interviewed. And he said Jamestown fans were baseball mad. They'd have to delay the start of the games because of the Lions. They seemed to love the players. Every day, you'd get invited to a different family's home for dinner. After games, the treasurer of the club would come into the locker room and ask who wanted money for that night. He'd just take it out of our paychecks and we'd have a heck of a time. John was drafted in 1942 and served in the U.S. Army from February 2nd, 42 through November 1945. He was discharged as a sergeant and during his time of service was awarded the Good Conduct Medal and the Purple Heart. While serving in the 36th Division, he was wounded and spent time in Naples Hospital. However, while there in the hospital, baseball was always on his mind as he organized a baseball team and was named the athletics director at the hospital. Before the invasion of Italy, while the 36 was in Africa, he caught for the Army-Navy All-Stars and was named the most valuable player in the North American theater of operations. Do you have any regrets going to baseball route then? No, I never regret. I loved every minute of it. That uh, you shouldn't live in the past. It's dangerous. But to visit it is a, just a, a wonderful experience. I got started, uh, by, first of all, this was my first hero. In oh, baseball. well, let's back up. Let's get this here. Jack was my my. He was. He was the bat boy for this team, and I thought that was the best job in the world. I was maybe 12, 13 years old, something like that. I thought, man, I want to be the bat boy of that ball club. But I never made but it. You didn't time. know all I had to do. I, I had no idea. All I knew is that you were crap at crap I had to take from guys like Pollock when you first got <laughs> to defend himself. All I knew was that you were at a baseball game every night, and I could think of nothing finer in the world than to be able to be at a baseball game every night and to see it being played. A rundown of that 1941 team where you were the bat boy. Frank Keller asks, and tried to figure out what is it that Jack really did. He made he made this isn't in anybody. This is statute of limitations. No one did after Jack. <laughs> hey, listen, I have to work like that for my money. Oh, wow. Jesus, wash those damn socks, shine the shoes. Then I got, then they cheat you out of your jaw. Oh, you have to go to Malibu. <laughs> hey, this guy owes me. This guy. To some of these other duties that I had, uh, the players used to pay me sometimes. 50 cents, I think it was, every two weeks or something for washing their sweatshirts and socks and whatever you have and cleaning the shoes and that whole bit. And, uh, How did these two guys do? They pay you? Well, I was hoping John wouldn't be here today, but... <laughs> oh, I'll tell you one thing about him. Either you paid him or you didn't get your sweatshirt. <laughs> Every now... You get your stock. You collected a lot of sweatshirts, too. <laughs> I, uh, every now and then I'd have a little problem, and uh, I'd go to Greg Malevy and say, well, so-and-so is a little slow. So next day the money would be right there. 
is a picture of Jim Barone in 1942. Did he succeed you? My job, I, I gave him some real intensive training there that, <laughs> in 1941. He spent more time in our locker room than he did working for Ben Kerner. And Ben's mother used to get on him something off of, Jimmy, Jimmy. Oh, God, they were looking for him all day. He, what about the great Johnny Newman? What are your recollections? Uh, probably was close to me as, as any of the ball players other than uh, than Greg Malevy, who I said, you know, he treated me like a kid. And uh, they used to, speaking of Greg, every once in a while they'd take me on a road trip, and Greg used to have a, a favorite trick he'd pull on me. They'd, I'd be, he'd be driving the wagon and I'd be sitting in the middle and there'd be somebody else over here and I'd doze off and fall asleep and he'd slam on the brakes and toot the horn and Jesus, I'd wake up and, you know, what, what, wonder what the hell was happening. Oh, God. But we had a, a lot of good fun and, and uh, the players were all good to me. I, uh, I remember one time Johnny Newman got a new baseball glove and geez, I like that glove. And uh, so I was playing a little bit myself. So I grabbed the glove and went out to play one day. Out, and Newman wasn't around. God, I wasn't out on that ball field 10 minutes with guys in the Muni League. And down comes Newman. And give me hell. Oh, he gave me hell for, for using his brand new glove. But Jesus, I love that glove. Those characters around the stadium. I don't know how much uh, conversation you guys have had about baseball fans, but we had some. Oh, God. Of course, uh, you know, I think the majority of those guys that used to sit behind first base, I think they oiled themselves up down the stadium grill or Buffalo grill before, and you know. Claire Barstow. Oh, God, I remember that. Claire Barstow with his little cap tipped to one side and that cigar out of his mouth. And, He'd sing and dance. <laughs> Benny Bulow, the old bread man, he would oh, yeah. be out there, oh. holler, perk up out there, perk up out there, come on. <laughs> <coughs> but they had some good loyal fans, and of course, Dick Sherman, everybody remembers him. Dick was pretty good to me. Dick uh, used to take me around to some of the road games, and I'd ride with him. We'd go to Bradford, I can remember coming back from Bradford nights after a game and you got that fog had set in and you, you know, you'd hardly make it home and Dick would he, you know, he put the pedal to the metal or metal to the pedal or, but he, Dick was a nice, nice fellow. And when I, we had some big crowds down there. Hell, we just, there was nothing to have 5,000 people there. Tell us about Jake Piddler. Probably the best manager in my estimation who treated me the best <coughs> was one of the most hated by the fans and that was Jake Pittler. You know, I always liked to see Jake Pittler come to town because he was good for a couple of bucks. He, 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 he give me a couple of bucks when I bring him his towels or something. He was very nice. Jack Sanford was a nice guy but Jake was just about the best. Pat Gallagher, a little short guy. Tell me about Pat Gallagher. Little mustache. I don't think he had a tooth in his head, did he? God, he used to be back there by that ticker tape, you know. And, but Pat used to post all the scores down there. Pat's up there keeping score on the board. He, you know, gets it off the tape. So I don't know what team it was, but they scored 11 runs in one inning. So one of these wise guys says, "Pat, how can that be? How many ball players on a team?" That's says nine. He says, how the hell can they score 11 runs? So he erased it and put it nine.
recollections and highlights of that first year with the likes of Johnny Newman and that new ballpark. Well, people, you know, people hadn't, in, in Jamestown, hadn't seen anything like that. First of all, we had this nice, brand spanking, shiny new ballpark with outfield fences and yeah. advertising on the fences, you know, oh, Christ. <laughs> They had seen that in the big leagues, but uh, and maybe Offerman Stadium in, in Buffalo. But here we are in little old Jamestown, and all of a sudden with a big stadium like that, and see a guy like him get up and knock that ball over that field. Those people went crazy. They went crazy. You were a celebrity. Here you're seen coming off the field in 1941. It says, Falcon Skipper leaves Diamond after injury. Manager Greg Malevy is shown after he trudged off the Diamond in the first half of the first inning of Jamestown's clash with the London Pirates. From left to right, pitcher Dick Schmidt, fat boy Jack Gallagher, and Greg Malevy. What was it like to be a celebrity? Your ego, you know, when people come up and ask you for your autograph. Oh, God. How did you feel the first time somebody asked you for your autograph? I didn't know what to do. Really. It's funny. You know, my dad had a picture of that. 41 team hanging in his barber shop, and when the damn shop was sold, the picture got away from us. You know? oh, it was the only memento I had of the, uh, of the team. Almost 60 years later, Jack, your wish is our command. It just used to pick me up at night after the games. My dad had a little, he, he had a little trouble adjusting because uh, he was a little uncomfortable with me being around there for a while because uh, I guess he didn't think his son had ever heard that kind of language and right. all that right. stuff before, you know. But well, it, it was all right. I, I really enjoyed it. I Thanks for the memories. Over 100 Jamestown players have graduated to the big show, with Nellie Fox being the only one to go from Jamestown to Cooperstown. Many of the stars left Jamestown and found their way up to the AAA, the closest you can get to the major leagues. One of those was Jamestown's own Lyle Parkhurst. Lyle Parkhurst was born December 18th, 1924. He came to Jamestown when he was four years old. He attended Love Grade School and Washington Junior High, entering senior high school in 1941. Lyle pitched for Collins Sports Shop and the American Legion team in 1939 and 1940 with the Crescent AC and Spiders Muni Class A My League's teams and for the Poland Center in the Chautauqua County League before becoming involved with the Jamestown Falcons. I came down here and asked Mr. Bisguyer and Greg Malibi if I could throw batting practice for them. Well, being a left-handed pitcher, they didn't like that because they were, they have trouble with left-handed uh, pitchers, you know, and the more they can get out there and throw batting practice for them, the better off they are. On August 16th, 1941, Harry Bisguyer signed Lyle Parkhurst to a Jamestown contract. The price, $65 per month. Though he did not pitch during the 1941 season, he did learn an awful lot. Here's Lyle next to manager Greg Malevy. The first strikeout I had, I thought they were coming right out of the stands. Oh, yeah. uh, it was a Sunday afternoon, I think it was the second or the third ball game of the year. I threw a couple pitches to him and he fouled them off, and then I threw a curveball in the dirt and struck him out. My third out, see. Boy, the stand he could holler. Uh, Lou Brown, remember Lou Brown? He's sitting up there. Boy, I'm telling you, he had a field day on that, you know. I enjoyed that. Johnny Newman, he used to hit baseball that the shortstop used to jump for and just missed on the end of the glove and up and out. They used to go. But I'll never forget old John. He, uh, he's always talking about being a left fielder, see. He's a left fielder. He, he had to be a left fielder. He, uh, he caught, and they put him on the mound a few times to throw a knuckle ball to know. And John, he was a good ball player. He was a hustler, and, but he was uh, one of these kind of guys that would pull a string on you, and he would 
he would uh, play with you a little bit, and, uh, but when he got down to business, he was there, you know. And the night the Jamestown Falcons won the playoff championship against Olean in 1942, the Falcons had trailed 8-3 to three going into the ninth inning. After two were out, the Falcons scored seven runs and won the game. Olean manager Jake Pittler was so angry, he battered a hole clean through their wooden dugout with his head no less. Age 19, Lyle Parkhurst was elevated to the highest minor league level, the Buffalo Bisons, where he had a 3.57 ERA while losing three games. He was used mainly in relief. The 1944 season saw Lyle returning home with the Jamestown Falcons and had his greatest year in professional baseball. He has recollections of a 16-year-old player who joined the team known as Nellie Fox. Fox was signed from Connie Mack's Philadelphia farm team and Harry Bisgar at the time said, this kid will go to the majors someday. To me, if there's anybody who should be there, Nellie should be there. Well, how about playing in the minor leagues with him? Did you realize then that he was Oh yeah, because Nellie, he was uh, quick on his feet, and he, uh, uh, he had a good pair of hands, and he uh, was learning the game of baseball at the time, and uh, he played every position but pitch. Every position but pitch and catch. He was in the outfield. I love him in the outfield. But I'd throw pitches in there that I'd make mistakes on, and I knew that if he was in center field, he'd track the darn thing down, and he did. And, uh, but he good ball player, good heady ball player, it, uh, team ball player. Could he hit? Oh yeah, uh, he's one of those punch hitters, you know, and uh, if he, he needed to hit him in the hole someplace, he'd hit it in the hole someplace. Give himself up so that he could hit it in the hole. Iron Joe Gisbert, now there was a character, I'll tell you, you know. Uh, a good game, did he call your games when you were pitching or did you call your game? No, 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 he did, I never, no, I, ne I didn't call my ball games, it was there. If they got base hits, it was a catcher's fault, not mine. <laughs> Us, as I said, were uh, really the younger group of players that were signed by the Tigers. Uh, Jamestown had a working agreement with the Philadelphia Athletics at the time, and that's how we came to have uh, Nellie Fox, who probably was one of the best second basemen of all time in the American League. Nellie was with the... Uh, athletics at the time and he was sent down to Jamestown by uh, the legendary Connie Mack who said at one time that Nellie would probably be one of the best center fielders they ever had when he grows up but Nellie as you know never got to be more than five foot seven or eight and did wind up at second base being one of the best second basemen. Lyle Parkers ended the season 1944 season with 20 wins and 10 losses and an ERA of 2.37. But that fact alone did not capture the attention of the sporting news in 1944. Let's hear the story. Yeah, that was uh, right uh, uh, at the tail end of the season. They were trying to get in the playoffs. What year? 44. 44. Who was the man? Was our manager. Okay, I see. Carnegie was our manager here. Um, we played them here two ball games at the end of the season, mm -hmm. Labor Day. And I had 18 wins at the time, 18 and 10. And uh, uh, it was my turn to pitch uh, the next to the last day. And so I did. And I shut them out. And that made 19. And uh, I was uh, good enough to be ahead of the hitters enough time, so I didn't work that much. I didn't throw too many, you know. And so uh, uh, the next day, uh, I asked Ollie, I said, hey, Ollie, you know, I said, that 20th win would look great. I said, you know, I said, I didn't too work too hard yesterday. He said, uh, how about letting me work today? Well, he didn't know. He had talked with this guy, you know, what I mean, you know. And so he come back and he said, yeah, he said, go ahead and do it if you want to. Said, but he said, if you get in trouble, he said, I'm going to get you out of there. Six inning of rain. We're head up to nothing. <laughs> I got the 20th win, and they lost their ball game, and they lost their playoff spot too. That's the big That's thing over there. Here. That's why it was fun. <laughs> yes, it was. I enjoyed. 45 would find Lyle back in Jamestown, 
when here he is seen with Harry Bisgeyer. During his half season with the team, he was 11 and 4. The Lyle Parkhurst pitching record in Jamestown closed out that year. And what three years they were. Fans would not long forget. After Lyle departed from Jamestown with that remarkable record, he pitched throughout the minor leagues from 1946 through 1954. I got ahead of him. I had two strikes and a ball on him. And the catcher, he wanted me to throw another curveball. And I shook him off, and he hollered out, and he said, you'll be sorry. And, and uh, he hit that sucker. Uh, that curveball, it, it just nicely got started going up as it went out of the ballpark. <laughs> uh, right on top of the roof and landed. And I watched him go around there, you know, and they had the Major League umpire there because they were playing Major League ball clubs, see. And he said, that's all right, young man. He said he does with the best of them. I come to find out that he did. He did yeah. But uh, uh, that was uh, one of the highlights for me as far right, as I'm concerned. I enjoyed that. The votes were counted for the all-time player, Jamestown Professional Baseball, during its 50th anniversary. Leading vote-getter for those players playing for the, during the period 1939 through 1969, you see it, Lyle Parkhurst, first, Nellie Fox, second, Johnny Newman, third. Tonight, of course, played for Jamestown back in 1942, 44, and Between 1940 and 1950, penicillin was introduced, and the atom was split. Orson Welles made his masterpiece, Citizen Kane. Rogers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma opened on Broadway. And Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected president a third time and a fourth.